speaking of praying with the Old Testament, what do we learn from the Bible about prayer when we began this year talking about different prayers of Paul, then we talked about Jesus and what we learned from him, and then praying with the Old Testament. We've been working our way sequentially through the Old Testament, so you know, we began with Abraham, and then we worked our way to, to Moses, and then you know, even last week was Jonah. So if you notice, we were kind of following along through the Old Testament. Well, this is our last in this series today, and we're going to look at none other than Nehemiah. Nehemiah. And as this effort to rebuild the walls of, of Jerusalem is described in this amazing book, I mean, it's an awesome testimony to service. It's a book really about volunteering, people coming and God's people together and saying, in his strength, we can do something. In this God-fueled effort, we see God continue to provide and bless for his people. It's a remarkable story. If it's a book about serving and volunteering and coming together, it's also a book about praying in the midst of serving. So there's tons to learn about Nehemiah, there's tons to learn about service, but, but even more so, it's a book about learning to pray in the, the midst of service and in the midst of real life. And that's one of the things I love and what I think we can learn the most, even from Nehemiah's example. What I appreciate about him and his prayer life is that it is not something that is distinct from the realities of his life. So you don't have Nehemiah with this like great devotional and prayer life over here, and then he serves over here, and how the two fit together, he's like, I, I, I don't really know. As you read, throughout Nehemiah are scattered a wealth of, of, of prayers that are, that are real, and they're real life, they're real situation prayers. So in our time together, I want to look at several of these prayers, what they teach us about praying in real time, as we're going to describe it. And that being said, let's actually pray one more time and just ask that God will continue to speak to us. Lord, we're grateful for this time. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for what it teaches us uh, about discipleship and growing. And more than anything, we thank you for what it teaches us about your son, Jesus, and all the riches of life in him. So we open our hearts to what you want to say to us this morning, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. So the first moment of prayer that I want to consider in Nehemiah's life comes very early on in the book. The first chapter of Nehemiah reminds us that Nehemiah discovers the needs in Jerusalem when he is working in this foreign government. God's people are in exile. And so for two Jewish travelers, he hears the state of affairs back in their homeland in Israel. And it's not good. Um, things are in disarray. And, and very symbolically, he learns that the walls of, of Jerusalem, this, this jewel of, of, God's, of God's land, are broken down. And so Nehemiah hears this, and he's really heartbroken about this. And he begins to fast, and he begins to pray. And in the midst of this, apparently, he begins to, to foster a plan. I think it's actually the Holy Spirit working in his heart, and the plan is to go and to somehow help in this effort. Now, right at the end of chapter 1, we are told that Nehemiah isn't just a, a Johnny come lately with a pipe dream that's like, nice, nice thought, Jeremiah or uh, Nehemiah, but it's never going to happen. Rather, he's someone that holds a very high government post. Specifically, he was the cupbearer of the king, which when you really think about it in that day and age is a tremendous responsibility. The very life of the king is protected by him. So he's a guy with connections, and given the right moment, pieces could come together for what God is laying on his heart. So we begin reading there, Nehemiah chapter 2. Verse 1, in the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence, and the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you're not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. You weren't supposed to, you know, be a downer in the king's presence, okay? So he's really afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. 
Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. (laughs) Nehemiah has been praying, praying, praying. And I believe that in his prayers is included, God somehow opened the door so I can speak to the king about this. Despite his position, he didn't just have the authority to kind of bring whatever agenda he wanted to work every day. That wasn't his privilege. So he's saying, God, please somehow open the door for me to speak with him about this important matter. Then the moment came, that take it or leave it moment, and Nehemiah offers this here we go, Lord, prayer. Nehemiah offers this buckle your seatbelt prayer. We're going over the cliff prayer. There is no going back. Nehemiah actually could have gotten in a lot of trouble for bringing this need, or the king could have really looked on it with disfavor or suspicion. Why do you want to go and rebuild this other kingdom, and what's this all about? What are your true motives? So understand, he's, he's fearful but brave. I just love the connection that we see here in the prayer model. Nehemiah's got this baseline, deep, deep prayer work that he's been doing, fasting, saying, God, put this thing together. What do you want to do? Lay this on my heart. But then there's also this moment where he's got to offer this, this arrow prayer, if you will, or sometimes I've heard them described as like these popcorn prayers, like there's not a lot of time for words. It's here we go. And so you couple this base of prayer with the moment of action. And it's a fantastic model for us. Fantastic model for us. This might be something that you've had experience with, or maybe it's something that would be a help to you now. You've been praying for a loved one or a child, and you have a sense that I really need to talk with them, Lord. I need to, to come around them, and I'm just praying for them. I'm praying for them. I'm praying for them. And in particular, God, would you open the door and the moment and the right situation? And then that moment comes, right? And, and, and what do you need? You just need the Lord to work and open that door. And so right then and there, then it's like, buckle your seatbelt prayer, Lord. Here, here we go. Or maybe you've needed to make a change in life or, or career. Lord, show me and there's months of prayer sometimes and then all of a sudden you get some email that says are you interested in this opportunity you've got 24 hours to respond right (laughs) lord okay here we go here we go and this is just such a great thing because nehemiah is not caught off guard he's been praying 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 and now in this moment it's not just desperation it's not just fear but it's an outflow of what has been already laid by way of foundation in his life this tornado cleanup team that I mentioned from this past week, I shared last, last Sunday that we had heard about a need to help a camp. We kind of put the word out there. On a regular basis, I'm praying, God, help us to be a life-giving church. Can, can we be a church that doesn't see the resources that you put in our hands as something to be hoarded and just held to ourselves? So pray that on a regular basis. And then this week, the need came. This camp that we have connections with needs people to come, and Lord, here we go, and we don't have a lot of time to, to think about it. So, you know, at first, the, the, the thought, the prayer, God, could you raise up 10 people from our church to go? God said, absolutely, but let's bring some more for fun. So in the end, it was 17 folks that were able to join us, and we just worship God for that and praise him for that. And I, I think also about the individuals who were able to go, and it was a random time in the middle of the week, and so it just, I know there were so many who would love to go, but work and other commitments. But for a little subset of our congregation, they're praying all the time, God, use me, use me, and then all of a sudden they hear this. One of the people who came with us this last week, Wednesday, just happened to be her day off. If we had gone on Tuesday, couldn't have gone. Thursday, couldn't have gone. Wednesday, here we go, Lord, let's do this thing, Right? And I just love that example in the midst of something practical, real life like this this trip. But then in all of your lives as well, you have a hundred stories like this where you've been praying and Lord, 
I'm in and show me the plan and the foundational work. And then in that moment, Lord, here we go. Lord, pull it together. And Nehemiah gives us a great example of that. A great example. Next, let's look at Nehemiah chapter 5 for a little bit. As you study this leader, he is a fantastic example of, of lots of things, particularly his integrity. Nehemiah is blessed by the king. He does get to travel to Jerusalem. In fact, in the end, he has quite a significant position there as governor over the city. There's lots of privileges that could have come his way, but one thing that we learn from Nehemiah is he's not about to abuse those privileges. So he's a great example of a leader. And in the midst of one of these situations wherein he could have kind of taken advantage of his role, but he decides not to, there's a real special prayer that arises from his lips, and it's helpful to us. Verse 18 of chapter 5 says, Now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every ten days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I have done for this people. With right decisions made, with integrity in his heart, Nehemiah actually prays, God, would you remember my service to you? Will you remember you know, I talked with our staff this week, and I was grateful for their, their help um, on this particular passage with me, because I was wondering, Lord, what's the right application of this kind of prayer in our lives? Because culturally, we tend to think that, that humility and kind of a response of nothing to see here, and, and God, this is just for your glory, so it just, you know, I don't even want any kind of recognition at all. That's kind of the way that we feel is most natural. And and there's so much right to that. I mean, there's, there's humility, and that is a, a virtue, and it's true. And yet, at the same time, there's nothing inappropriate with desiring to hear from Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. To remember what is said in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Our God is very generous. The scriptures speak to us regularly about spiritual rewards, some that are reaped here even in this life, but most and many in our heavenly reward. And Nehemiah's eyes are open to this, and he, he prays about this. He even prays this again in chapter 13 on two different Occasions And as he does, I, I believe two things happen. One, I think he's honoring God's character in the midst of this. He knows that God is a generous and, and a good Lord, and he recognizes his character by way of saying, Lord, will you remember me and my service for you? And then also I think he keeps it in perspective. He keeps his role in perspective, remembering he is accountable to a king. He might be governor, but there's a king. And the long game is in sight. And so I think this kind of prayer can have a fitting and a right place in our lives as well. First, bring that, that sense of focus, right? Am I living a life that honors the Lord? Are the things that I do something that I can actually say, Lord, remember my service to you? It's kind of tough to pray that prayer if I'm just living for myself and using all my resources to build my own kingdom and better myself, right? It's very different. Am I living a life that honors him? But then also an encouragement, I think, that as we pray that, we're reminded that God doesn't forget. God doesn't forget our acts of service done for him. So on a volunteer Sunday, it's good to remember that our service to the Lord is something that honors him. Scripture sometimes uses the, the, the imagery of the Old Testament uh, fragrant offering. When God's people put their service before him faithfully in his hands, it's something that to God smells really good. I love that image. You ever, you ever walk in after work, 
someone in the house has put the crock pot on or they bake brownies? What's, what's that aroma that to you is like, oh man, that's awesome. It's the Lord, his response to people who serve him with loving hearts. He doesn't, he doesn't forget. And we've talked here this morning about service, you know, kind of within our context because we didn't want to forget about that, but so many of you serve in just so many different ways. Giving, generosity, tithing, whether it's here to other ministries, God doesn't forget that. So many of you giving care to children in your home, grandchildren, day after day after day, that honors the Lord. Don't, don't forget. He doesn't forget. Toil to provide for your family. Many of us have jobs that yeah, it wasn't our, our dream as we grew up, but it's it's where we are. It's where we landed. That's it's the career path right now. And I'm being faithful. And God doesn't forget your toil because you love and caring for your family. Many of you care for aging parents. And you wonder, does anybody notice? And maybe they're even in a situation where they don't even maybe remember you. God doesn't forget not so long ago, we had a little gathering of, of some of our teen volunteers who, who serve in, in uh, the nursery and with our children's ministry, and we wanted to train them in a couple specific areas. And I won't forget in that moment, one of the moms who was blessed by these teenagers' service and was helping with the training actually encouraged the students with, with emotion and, and with tears and said, you know what, what you kids are willing to do on a regular basis is such a blessing to us that we get to sit in the service and just hear and be blessed and just for a little window of time in the week get to focus in on the on the Lord and and uh, love our kids but not have distractions in that moment I can't help but think if that's the reaction of a human heart think on the Lord and how he remembers and how it honors him isn't it wonderful that we serve a Savior who is very forgetful as it relates to our sins, right? Because of who Jesus is and what he did. But he's incredibly generous to remember our service to him and even to reward us, even our flawed and our limited service and bless us for our service to him. As we're walking through Nehemiah, I want to stop now briefly at Nehemiah chapter 4. This isn't so much a, a prayer as it is a word on prayer and, and practicalities, and I think, again, a helpful model for us, especially in our service. You know, there are some people who maybe tend more towards prayer, but then maybe overdo kind of, well, we put it in God's hands, and you know what? Nothing more to do here. Other people are all action-oriented, We've got this done, and then, oh, we've kind of forgot to pray. You know, at one point in the building of the wall, things were really coming to a heated point, and there were opponents that said to Nehemiah, you need to stop this work, you need to stop it right now, and if you don't stop, well, we're going to stop you by force. What's Nehemiah to do? Should he pray, or should he act? and prepare for battle. This is why I find Nehemiah chapter 4 and then verse 8 and 9 so helpful. It says this, And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as protection against them day and night. Both. First, pray. Pray first, always. And then do practical things as the Lord makes this clear. I really appreciate this helpful pattern. And I think it's something that can really help us walk and, and do ministry and, and serve effectively in the Lord. I love watching in our church the way that this plays out. You are all prayer warriors. You all serve in various situations where you're praying, you're praying. And then we also have ministry teams. And these teams pray together, but you also plan together. 
you know that God's got it, but you also say the Lord can use this to, to, to put things together. In fact, this is a wonderful way to see God and the different gifts that he has given to us. Some of us are more visionary types. Ready, fire, aim. And it's a great place to be because honestly, those people generally lead out and see new initiatives started, right? Others of us tend to be more the planners, right? And what do you mean go there before we have a plan? We might die. So let's actually put some things in place and let's get a plan in place so that this thing actually works. Now, if each of those go their own direction all by themselves, it'd be a train wreck on either side, but you put those two kind of giftings together and it's effective and it's strong. So whichever one of those poles you kind of tend towards as you serve in the church, ask that the Lord might ally you with a buddy, with someone who has, you know, complementary gifts is a great way to serve. It's a great way to serve, and it's a great way to pray. Lord, you've got this thing, but now show us how you would have us faithfully act. That's Nehemiah chapter four. Last prayer we're gonna look at is Nehemiah chapter six. As we already mentioned, enemies were against this work that God was doing from the start, and they tried everything to undermine what Nehemiah was doing. They tried violence. They engaged in misinformation campaigns. I mean, anything you can imagine to get Nehemiah to quit. And there's just so many of these throughout the course of this book. You just wonder, how did this guy make it? I mean, there were certainly moments where he just wanted to throw in the towel and go, you know what, my job back with the king and the cupbearer, that was cushy, good paycheck. This is not worth it. But he doesn't quit, so how does he make it? We see, you know how he makes it because... Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 9 tells us. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work. Nehemiah's not going to make it. He's going to quit. This work will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. You can't, you just can't get any more practical of a prayer than this. A more real-time prayer than what we have here. This is like the most hypothetical of all hypothetical questions. Anyone ever feel in this room like you're tired and you just can't do this anymore? Anybody ever feel that way? You're probably feeling that way this morning or you're, you're here right now going, God, I just can't go back to that situation this afternoon or I can't go back to that situation tomorrow morning. This is a prayer for you. Short, to the point, with a proven track record. God, strengthen my hands. Help me endure. It makes me think of Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And then, of course, the, the inverse of that that we're supposed to understand is if the Lord is the one building the house and if he's the one watching over the city wow we just find so much strength there we will mount up with wings as eagles my wife christy has this great short statement that she just uses to encourage herself and then she shares it with others who are just trying to hold on i can't but he can i can't but he can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so what a prayer for life and for service. Whether, again, this is volunteering in, in the ministries of this church in those moments where you're like, oh, God, I'm just feeling like I'm ready to be done with this, but I know you're still calling me to it. Lord, strengthen my hands. Or, again, it's some area of service that, you know, you know, and the Lord knows. Maybe a lot of other people don't know. But you need strength. And God is at the ready to do this. Because when we look to Him and we rely on His strength, it's sufficient. He remembers not only our service, but that we can't do it without Him. You know, as we close, I just want to make mention of, of the way that we read 
the book of Nehemiah because there's two ways that we can read it. It is appropriate to read the book of Nehemiah and to say, God, what can we learn from this, this follower of, of you, this Old Testament disciple? How can I be like him and pray like him? Very fitting, and we learn a great deal. There's another way to read the book of Nehemiah, and I think it might even be the better. Imagine that you are one of the people who were helping with the effort. Read the book of Nehemiah as if you are someone who was a part of the work as opposed to Nehemiah himself. And see how awesome it was to be a worker, but to have a, a leader like that. To have a leader of integrity. To have a leader of prayer. To have a leader that the burden wasn't on you, the burden was with them. And now realize, you know what? You actually do have such a leader in your life. You serve a greater, greater king. Jesus far surpasses Nehemiah in, in every way. And he's the one who we can look to. He's the one with literally the perfect prayer life. And our Savior who intercedes for us in real time. He's the Savior who remembers who knows what we're going through. And he doesn't forget. He's the Savior who has plans for us and a vision. And he's the plan, a leader who comes around us and who wraps his hands around ours to strengthen them and to remind us that we are never alone. I love this image of strength in my hands, but imagining his big strong hands coming around our own you have people in in your life who have worked the land i, I know some of you uh, are, are those individuals i remember my step grandfather johnny and i remember his his working hands and just how big and and strong they were i think like his ring was like this big like it just and i just think that this guy who had strong hands you know brought in 60 crops you know i just think god strengthened my hands and I imagine god's big strong hands coming around my own and saying hold on you're never alone so friends we have a lot to learn from nehemiah this old testament disciple how we can pray that i'll just wrap with this thought we have an even greater hope in Jesus, in the one who leads us, the one who sings over us, the one who prays for us.